Good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, go ahead and open your Bibles, if you can, to uh, 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 9. And you may also want to keep your finger in chapter 15 of the same book. I'll be uh, appealing to that a couple of times this morning as well. Several, several years ago, uh, my now wife Becky and I read together Frank Herbert's 1965 novel Dune in preparation for the film adaptation in 2021, which was a very romantic choice on my part, I felt. Um, when it was first released, Dune was really a game changer in the world of epic science fiction, uh, and it's still regarded as a masterpiece in secondary world building. But for Frank Herbert, the author, the novel and its five sequels were about more than that. In a 1985 speech at UCLA, Herbert said, I wrote the Dune Saga because I had this idea that charismatic leaders ought to come with a warning label on their foreheads, maybe dangerous to your health. Herbert clarifies this in a passage from Chapter House Dune, his final novel in the series. He writes, all governments suffer a recurring problem. Power attracts pathological personalities. It is not that power corrupts, but that it is magnetic to the corruptible. Such people have a tendency to become drunk on violence, a condition to which they are quickly addicted. What's ironic about this is that the pathological personality at the center of Herbert's first novel, Paul Atreides, does not start off as a particularly bad guy. He's likable, well-intentioned, and makes a genuine effort to limit the violence and destruction in the world around him. Paul Atreides wants to do the right thing, when the people around him start treating him as more than a mere man, he ends up making a very different impact than the one he intended. And yet there's something enticing and natural to all of us about treating people that way. We all find it natural to worship, to look at something or someone and say in our heart of hearts, that's awesome, that's beautiful. I want that or I want them. That'll solve my problems. That is God. And in the same way, there's something enticing to all of us, I think, about being worshipped. To have everyone else look at us and say in their heart of hearts, they're awesome. They're beautiful. I want them. I want them to be in charge. They'll solve all my problems. They are God. Now, let's be clear. It's not, it's not wrong to enjoy good relationships with other people. It's not wrong to enjoy compliments or commendations or companionship from those around us. But if you're honest with yourself, if I'm honest with myself, then we have to acknowledge that we have a hunger for others' approval that surpasses our love for God and hurts others. Herbert's science fiction epic is about more than sandworms and spice harvesters. It's about the fact that it matters who or what we worship, and it's also about what we do when we receive worship from other people, especially since we're not supposed to. Here's our big idea for this morning. Because we are not worth worshiping, we must serve the God who is. Because we are not worth worshiping, we must serve the God who is. With that said, let's stand together and read 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 9. As soon as David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him so that Saul sent him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. As the women sang to one another, as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, 
They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? And so I, David, from that day on. This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Father God, I know that um, I need what I'm about to share this morning uh, just as much as everybody else. I know that I am easily tempted to value others' approval over you. And so I ask that you would remind each one of us this morning that we are not worth worshiping and that you are. Um, and, that, and that we therefore have the responsibility and the privilege to serve you. God, I ask that you'd get me out of the way, um, that, that people would not remember me up here, but they would, they would see um, your beauty and their responsibility in your word um, through, through what I share this morning and that uh, we would go out once we're finished here and live that way. In your name, amen. You can take a seat. Last week, Jordan Schmidt began by drawing our attention to the first three of the Ten Commandments. The first three rules God gave to Moses as part of the founding document for the new nation of Israel. They're simple, but they're important. You'll have no other gods before me. You're not making an image to worship, and you will not take my name in vain. These laws were part of the covenant, the promise, the agreement between God and Israel an agreement that set them apart as a unique nation. You guys are special. You are in a special relationship with God as their single undisputed king. And if we read beyond Exodus 20, we'll see a pattern in which God proves himself to be a good king, a king who makes just laws, just decisions, fights on behalf of his people, provides for their needs, and grants them forgiveness in the midst of repeated and defiant sin. Now that pattern continues long after the life of Moses. God leads his people into a promised land, judges justly, again forgives sins, rescues them from frequent threats of violence. Throughout the book of Judges, we see God repeatedly choosing men and women to rise up in leadership to represent him to Israel and to ride to Israel's defense in the midst of danger. But it's really not about these men and women. It's about God himself choosing to defend his people as a wise and powerful king. And finally, after years of this cycle, the 12 tribes of Israel come to God's prophet Samuel with a single request. We want a different king. We don't want the God of Moses. We don't want Yahweh of hosts. We want a king like all the other nations a king that will judge us the way we want him to, that fights wars the way we want him to. We want a substitute savior, a replacement recipient of worship. We want a king. In fact, we want any other possible king than Yahweh. We want any other possible king than God. And Samuel actually warns them against this. He warns that the king that they want will take away their harvests their children, their freedom. He'll conscript them to fight his wars. That's the kind of king the other nations have. That's the kind of king you get when you reject Yahweh as your God. We still want a king. Still want one. We don't care. And in answer, God gave them Saul. Now think for a moment what it would have felt like to be Saul at his coronation to receive the kingship from the, hand of, from the hand of God's hand-picked prophet, knowing that the reason that the crown is being placed on your head right now is because the God of the universe, the God who led these people out of Egypt, just wasn't good enough for them. But you were. Think about how that's going to impact you. How would that knowledge affect you if you were Saul? Three observations this morning. Firstly, because we are not worth worshiping, we must regularly remember that God is glorious. Because we are not worth worshiping, we must regularly remember that God is glorious. The people of Israel went to Samuel asking for a warrior king instead of Yahweh, and Saul was the king he gave them. And at first, Saul actually looks pretty good. 
actually almost opts out of his own coronation. He goes into hiding when they're like, hey, we gotta, we gotta put a crown on your head. Where are you? You gotta go looking for him. And it looks like maybe he's not interested in the power that has been given to him. At the end of his first battle, he forgives those who dissent from his rule in God's name. He's like, you know, God gave us this great victory today. I'm not gonna like kill you just because you don't want me to be king. He credits God with the salvation of Israel. Everything we know about Saul from like in that little moment makes him look like he might shape up to be a genuinely good leader, at least at first. He seems to acknowledge that he's not worth worshiping and seems to remember that God is glorious, at least on the outside. From an outside perspective, Saul has all the makings of a good king. He looks great on the outside. But if you read carefully through 1 Samuel 11 through 15, you'll notice a pattern in Saul's rule. Go ahead and look it up more slowly if you want to later. While Saul is happy to praise God for saving Israel from the Ammonites at the beginning of his reign, with every new crisis that arises, Saul more and more chooses to place his own fame above God's honor. Now, at first, it looks like they're kind of on a level. Saul's fame, God's honor, those are the same thing. I can do both. But one eventually wins out. And it increasingly wins out as you read carefully through the story of his career. When he first learns that those same Ammonites are attacking Israel, he actually threatens the Israelite tribes with death if they don't rally behind Samuel and Saul. That's chapter 11, verses 5 through 7. Samuel and Saul, that's who you got to rally behind. There's a name missing in that list. That's the most important name there is. It's God's name. He does not call them to rally behind the God who crowned him. And in Saul's first clash with the Philistines later, he wrongly chooses to offer sacrifice in order to buy God's favor in chapter 13, verse 12, and then prohibits his soldiers from eating during a subsequent battle against these Philistines. You can find that in chapter 14, verse 24. At first, these examples might actually seem like they pit Saul against his subjects. You know, he's being cruel to them. And they do look that way until you remember that the whole reason Israel asked for a king in the first place was to fight and win wars on their behalf. Saul was told that victory in battle would keep their approval. And by the time we reach chapter 15, we learn that it's really the people's approval that Saul is serving. It's not God. It's not even their good. It's their approval. 1 Samuel 15 describes Saul's war with the Amalekites, where after his victory, Saul sets up a monument on the battlefield to himself rather than to God, chapter 15, verse 12. When Samuel challenges Saul's decisions in this area, Saul's phrasing is telling. He says, I have transgressed the commandment of Yahweh and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. In other words, when I saw how much I enjoyed other people's praise, I forgot the glory of God. And yet even in his repentance, Saul is still committed to that same top priority. Later in the chapter, he actually pleads with Samuel saying, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return to me that I may bow down before Yahweh your God. Honor me before the elders. I want their attention. I want their worship. And then I'll bow down before God. That's the deal. That moment tells us that Saul's worship of God has strings attached. He's happy to link himself and his reign to Yahweh, but at a price. He'll bow down before Samuel's God. He can no longer call God his own, by the way. Note that. If it means that he can also enjoy honor before the elders of his people. He was happy to remember God's glory as long as everyone else was willing to tell him that he was really worth worshiping too. But he wasn't. He wasn't. During the 1924 Paris Summer Olympics, one of the favorites to win the 100-meter run was 22-year-old Scotsman Eric Little. Born to missionary parents in China, Little was a talented rugby player and sprinter with a good hope 
to bring home the gold for Great Britain until he discovered that the 100-meter race would take place on a Sunday. This led Little into a dilemma. He was eager to compete on behalf of his country, but he was also convinced that the opportunity clashed with his responsibility to honor the Lord's day and keep it holy. Simon Burnton writes for The Guardian that his decision to avoid the 100 meters was criticized in the press and even in Parliament, but his decision was absolute. Little might experience rejection from his country in one of the biggest international sporting events of all time, but honoring God was more important. He would run the 400 meters, an event for which he was not the favorite instead. And then on the morning of the race, someone slipped Little a note that read, in the old book it says, he that honors me, I will honor. Now, if you've seen the film Chariots of Fire, you know how the race ended, with Little setting a world, a world record of 47.6 seconds for the 400-meter sprint. But if he were standing before you, he would tell you that the run really wasn't the important thing. It wasn't an issue whether he won the race or not. That's not the issue. The issue is, do you honor God the best way you know how? Right? He went on afterwards to teach science at a missionary school in China. Now, on leaving Britain, he was about to get on the train and somebody asked him to deliver a speech. He refused to do it. I'm not going to speak to you. But let's sing a hymn instead. And he led them in a rendition of the hymn, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. He only returned to Scotland twice before his death in a concentration camp in 1945. On one occasion, he was asked if he ever regretted his decision to leave behind the fame and glory of athletics. Um, Bernson quotes him saying, it's natural for a chap to think over all that, all that sometimes, but I'm glad at the work I'm engaged in now. A fellow's life counts for far more at this than the other. Whether Eric Little met criticism or fame from his country, his response was the same. The repeated remembrance of the glory of God. Is that you? Are you, like Little, repeatedly remembering the glory of God? Or are you more like Saul? Think about what it feels like for you to get praise from friends, from colleagues, from family. Think about how the taste of your own importance tastes on someone else's tongue. Think about what it would be like to lose that sense of importance all the praise you enjoy from the people around you. Could you do it? Could you lose that if you had to? Or is it an idol? Is that what you're chasing for meaning, for security, for ultimate happiness? Or are you chasing God's pleasure? Because we are not worth worshiping, we must regularly remember that God is glorious. Number two, because we are not worth worshiping, we must refuse to compromise God's glory. Let me ask you this. What is it that makes the approval of others such an attractive idol? What problem are we expecting other people's praise to solve for us? Why do we get so comfortable replacing others' praise with God's glory? I wrote down four reasons. Maybe you could have more on your list. These were four that I thought of. We want security. We want power over others and even perhaps over God. We want to counterbalance our alienation from God. Saul said to Samuel, the Lord, your God. And so if he doesn't have relationship with God, then praise from others feels like a good substitute. We want to reassure ourselves that there is nothing wrong with our sin. And the advantage of public approval is that if we can get it and all those benefits with it, it's extremely easy to compromise God's glory and ignore God's commands. In fact, in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, we can see Saul doing exactly that. The chapter opens with Samuel coming to Saul and commanding him to go to war with Amalek. By this point, Amalek was an old enemy who had gotten in the way of Israel's return to the promised land. God commands Saul to march against them and destroy them and to devote to destruction all that they have. Burn it. Now, one of the reasons this command is so important is that it makes clear that this war isn't about all the standard benefits kings can get from wars. 
It's not about plunder or conquest or captives or any of the worldly benefits that you can secure from military victory. And what that means is that no one could profit by using this moment as a precedent to command future offensive warfare. Hey, let's go attack this neighboring tribe and take all their stuff. After all, God told Saul to do it. He's telling me to do the same thing. No one could say that because God told Saul, you don't get to keep any stuff. You burn it, right? And what that, and, and, and therefore it's meant as a one-time command that would serve absolutely no personal benefit to the people of Israel. This is about God's retribution and the prevention of future conflict, and that alone. But the downside to that command is that following it is high risk and low reward. If you're a soldier and you don't get to take home any plunder, that's not a great look. It's not a great deal because after all, I'm risking my life for this. I might die in this battle for nothing. Fighting war requires you to convince a lot of people to sign onto a project that might lead to their deaths. It's hard to motivate people with that promise unless they really believe that what you're asking them to do matters. So Saul took a shortcut. Saul compromised. He marched against Amalek like God intended, but Saul and the people took the the Amalekite king as a prize and plundered the best of the animals for their own gain and expressed disobedience to God's command in chapter 15, 8, and 9. What's amazing about this is that when Samuel goes to Saul to talk this over, Saul's ready with an extremely religious excuse. He says, I have obeyed the voice of Yahweh. I have gone on the mission on which Yahweh sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to Yahweh your God in Gilgal. We did it for you, God. We ignored your commands for you. We didn't really compromise your glory. We didn't really disobey. We did this in your name. Samuel's answer, once he sees how Saul has sacrificed his commitment to God, drips with irony. To obey is better than sacrifice. And when Saul has nothing more to fall back on, he admits his sin. He says it was because he feared the people and obeyed their voice. No matter how religious he tried to make himself look, this moment with the Amalekites showed that Yahweh wasn't receiving the worship of Saul's heart. His compromises proved that what really mattered to him wasn't the glory of God, it was the worship of others. It got worse. In the end, in the episode with the Amalekites, God ultimately renounced Saul's kingship. And shortly afterwards, Saul found himself trapped in another war with the Philistines. They sent forth their greatest champion, you might know the story, a giant called Goliath, who stalked back and forth in the Valley of Elah, challenging the best of the Israelites to win or take all single combat. Saul should have been the one to answer. He's the king after all. He's the warrior king. He's the one that they chose over God. But in the end, he, like all the other Israelites, cowered in fear at the taunts of the giant. In the end, he opted out of his kingly duties and compromised the glory of God. 249 AD, the Roman emperor Philip the Arab was killed in battle and succeeded by the veteran soldier and long-standing bureaucrat, Gaius Messius Quintus Trajanus Decius. There are more names, by the way, for that guy, but I didn't, I didn't write him out. For much of his prior political career, Decius was concerned about the growing instability of the Roman Empire. One of the reasons for this instability, as he saw it, was a growing religious cult originating in Judea that called themselves Christians. In general, Rome was pretty comfortable with most religious systems and, and worldviews and groups uh, practiced within its borders. But, and, the, and the reason for that is because most religions were happy to make room for other gods that they didn't necessarily commit to. But the Christians were different. Unlike most of those other religious groups, the Christians proclaimed a king higher than Caesar. Decius's answer to this was simple. An edict demanding everyone offer a pinch of incense in worship to the emperor and the official gods of Rome. Once they'd offered the incense, he'd receive a little piece of paper called a libellus. 
an official proclamation signed by notable local citizens that they were, in fact, loyal Roman citizens who had paid the recognition due to the Roman gods and especially the cult of the emperor. Now, the Libellus wasn't about getting people to renounce Jesus per se. That's not what it was about. In fact, we have record, like we have leftover Libeluses from, from history. We have fragments of them. They don't mention Jesus. They don't mention, yes, I renounce Jesus as my Lord. More than anything, these were about getting people to pledge their allegiance to Rome. Decius wasn't saying that Jesus was the problem. He was just insisting that the Christians recognize him as on par with or inferior to God, or so they, they, superior to, so Decius superior to the God they worship, sorry. Now some compromised and they offered the pinch of incest. incense. There we go. Um, some refused to offer the pinch of incense and then they bribed an official to write up a false libelus. Yes, Jordan Leg has offered the pinch of incense to Caesar, even though I didn't. And others refused to carry a libelus and were subject to fine, exile, starvation, torture, and if all else failed, death. Now it's important that we understand that death was a last resort here. Decius would have preferred the Christians give in. The whole point of fines, exiles, starvation, and torture was to make compromise more attractive. It wasn't about controlling them with pain. It was about controlling them with comfort. Some gave in and some refused. For many Christians, neither they nor Decius were worth worshiping. And because of that, they refused to compromise God's glory. How about you? You're not currently being threatened with a fine. Exile, starvation, torture, death. That's probably not your reality right now. For many of us, it's, it's just not, and it may not ever be in this life. But the truth is that there are compromises that you are able to make right now in the Monday to Saturday for the approval of others. The pressures you face to compromise God's glory may come in a much softer and more comfortable form than it ever came to them. Loss of friends, loss of a job, an increase in taxes. Maybe you speak up when you ought to be silent. Stay silent when you ought to speak up. Maybe there's some area of your life where you shrug off God's claim on you. It's not a religious issue, maybe. You tell yourself that God needs you to make this compromise. You're doing him a favor. That a choice like this is necessary in order to carry out his commands. I think evangelism, by the way, is one of the ways that we do this more, most readily. God, if I don't make this compromise, how will they ever hear the gospel? Maybe you tell yourself, if I buy a paper saying I gave incense to the Roman gods, it's not actually the same thing as doing it myself. Are you compromising the glory of God for the approval of others? Do you show by your life that neither you nor they are worthy of worship? And do you serve the God who is? Third point. Because we are not worth worshiping, we must resolve to honor God's decisions. Ultimately, God rejected Saul as king because Saul rejected God as king. After Saul's sacrifice at Gilgal, his plundering of the Amalekites, God's word through Samuel was clear. Yahweh has rejected you from being king over Israel. You will have no heir, and your kingdom will be taken away and given to someone else, given to a man after God's own heart. But this led to more than spiritual fallout in Saul's life. That was the most serious consequence, an alienation from the God who made him king. But it wasn't long before Saul's disobedience of God translated into hostility toward those around him. In his first war against the Philistines, Saul clashed with his son, Jonathan. Because while Saul went into battle for his own glory, Jonathan was committed to the glory of God. And again, once David defeated the giant Goliath for Saul, In God's name, Saul saw the acclaim he had received from the Israelite women. We read that just a moment ago. And after publicly rewarding David, he started using him for literal target practice with a spear. 
What strikes me most about this is how quickly Saul decides to do it. David comes home from battle, carrying Goliath's head in his hand, and everybody sees these parades of women who've already written music to celebrate David's victory. Note the song they sing, by the way. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. David has a kill count of one by this point. Like, note the text. Literally, he's coming home from killing the Philistine. He has a kill count of one. This is insane hyperbole. But they're already like, this is our guy. This is our guy. David kills one guy, one really big Philistine guy, but one guy. And unlike Saul, David actually dedicates his kill to Yahweh of hosts. It's not about David's strength in battle at all. That's the whole point of the story. But it doesn't matter to Israel or to Saul. Goliath's death is enough. Enough for the Israelite women to conclude, here's our new hero. Here's our new savior. Here's our new warrior king. And technically they were right. Only two chapters before, Samuel had secretly appointed David as Saul's successor, the new and upcoming king of Israel. Saul never knew that. The whole point of the ceremony was that it remain a secret ceremony. But Saul did understand how to read the warning labels that come with charismatic leaders. Saul concluded that if David already ruled the hearts of his subjects, it wouldn't be too long before he could take the throne as well. Why? Because when people turn away from you as their idol, it's easy to hate them for it or hate their new idol. And in the end, Saul couldn't let go of the worship of others. So he turned against God's decisions. David was God's new choice. And Saul said, I care more about keeping everybody else's approval, keeping my power, keeping my popularity, that I will work against the very decisions that God has made. The first year I taught in South Asia, one of the things that I most appreciated about the culture was the warmth and hospitality that greeted me. South Asian culture generally holds teachers in high respect. I was young and enthusiastic enough that I was able to connect with my first two classes with a surprising level of intimacy. I remember at the end of that year, standing in the school courtyard while students signed yearbooks, and then afterward reading over the signatures I'd acquired from the students who'd welcomed me that year. One in particular stands out in my memory, which a student literally and perhaps sincerely describes me as his idol. I felt good. Now, I don't say that to brag because that was six years ago. And in the six years since I started teaching, I've lost my novelty. Uh, I'm not new anymore. <laughs> and my patience as well. I've often lost my patience in ways that I'm not proud of. In preparing this sermon, I've had to seriously consider my own bent to idolize my students' approval. And then to turn on them and resent them when they choose to take it back. I'm afraid that sometimes it spurts out of me in little ways, in ways I can't hide judging unfairly and refusing to forgive students who have turned to a new idol. We can't underestimate this danger. Because we are not worth worshiping, we must honor God's decisions. Where are you at in this? Are you like me in this area? Are you like Saul in this area? Do you resent those who have rescinded their approval of you? Do you hold a grudge against them? Not that you'd ever admit it aloud, of course but deep in your heart where no one else can see it? Does it spill out sometimes in small ways, daily pinpricks and petty revenges against others because you know that you've fallen out of their favor? And if so, what are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? How do we solve this? By now we know how the, approval, the idol of approval works We've seen how it worked in Saul's life, and we've seen how it might work in ours. So what do we do about it? At the end of his career, the prophet Samuel warns the people to stay away from empty things. It's in chapter 12, like replacement kings and substitute saviors. And instead serve Yahweh with their whole hearts. He reminds them that as much as they've hungered for Saul and longed for his rule, Saul isn't their ultimate savior. And they aren't his. He isn't their true king. He's a representative, a stand-in, a fragile imitation, an image of the true God maybe, but a deadly idol who will forever crave more worship. So are we. So am I. 
Our lips confess that we are not worth worshiping. We do not deserve the honor that belongs to God alone. We sang that this morning. We know how important it is to regularly remember God's glory. We know how important it is to refuse to compromise God's glory. And maybe we here and now want to resolve to honor God's decisions. But it's not enough to know that these things are important. Saul himself knew they were important, but he never did them. So what do we do about this? The story of Saul tells us how dangerous it is to live for the approval of others, but it also shows us what it looks like when we live for God instead. So let's define that a little bit for a moment. If Saul is the man we don't want to be, David and Jonathan are in a small way the men we do want to be. The truth is that Saul spent his entire career running the kingdom like it was his kingdom rather than God's kingdom. We see this in loads of places throughout the story. I've highlighted a number of them already. But for me, one of the clearest proofs of this is in 1 Samuel 17, verse 8. Cast your mind back for a second to the Goliath episode, the Valley of Elah. Goliath, the Philistine champion, lumbers it down into the valley, full of arrogance and pride of his physical power, bellowing at the Israelite armies in front of him. And the first taunt he can think of is, are you not the armies of Saul? What's the correct answer to that question, by the way? No, they are not. Not technically. They're not the armies of Saul. They're the armies of Yahweh. But Goliath taunts, Saul. Why? It's because he doesn't know of anyone higher on the Israelite side that he can taunt. Right? When you taunt somebody, you attack their highest guy. You you attack the thing that they're most proud of, or perhaps their weakest, depending on the way you look at things. Right? Goliath doesn't know anything about Yahweh. He can't know. Because for years before this, Saul has been focused on setting up his own fame. Goliath's taunt proves that Saul has failed at representing God on the battlefield. In fact, he hasn't even really tried. And when he's challenged, when someone else comes along that has the power to take away Saul's popularity, and more than that, his life, Saul cowers. He folds like a bad hand. Compare that for a second to how David answers Goliath's taunts. If you know the story, you know that he's a shepherd, not a soldier. But he's also, as we've already seen, the newly appointed king of Israel. And when he shows up and hears Goliath's taunts, he realizes that he is responsible to stand against a giant in his army. At first, he takes insults, even from his own brother Eliab, and doubt from the cowering Saul. But David doesn't come as a servant of Saul. That's not why he's there. He comes as a servant of Yahweh of hosts who delivers Goliath into David's hand. David is a better king than Saul because he knows ultimately whose kingdom it is. Not David's kingdom, it's God's kingdom. David knew that he wasn't worth worshiping. When it came time to fight Goliath, David chose to fight in service of the God who is. And David wasn't alone in this. Jonathan, the son of Saul, sees that that is David's top priority. Where the rest of the kingdom sees their war hero, Jonathan sees a comrade who put his trust in the faithful God rather than the succulent taste of political and military stardom. And it's God's faithfulness to them that ultimately enables them to suffer disapproval, namely the murderous disapproval of the reigning king who will spend most of the rest of his life as an enemy to both his son and his most faithful servant. But David is more than a good example. In choosing to disregard Eliab's insults and go in alone against Goliath, risking his life against a giant no one else dared to fight for the glory of the true king of Israel, David foreshadows a far greater king. A king who likewise chose to endure the cruelty of others, who chose to suffer ultimate disapproval and rejection, choosing to face down death itself when no one else could, not just for his own glory, but for the glory of God the Father. Jesus was tempted with the approval of others. Bow before me and I'll give you the world. And ultimately chose the way of suffering. Jesus repeatedly refused the approval of others. Whenever people tried to make him their kind of king, he did something that turned them all away. 
eat flesh, drink blood. Jesus suffered the ultimate abandonment, betrayed by a friend, condemned by his people, and hung on a cross to die. Jesus achieved the ultimate victory over the idol of approval by suffering. How? While we long for the approval of our peers, Jesus longed for the glory of his Father. He knew that his Father was worth worshiping and chose to serve him at all costs. For what purpose? To demonstrate that he really is worth worshiping and to grant us his victory, Jesus' victory, over the idols that we serve. How? God the Father accepts Jesus' worship as if it came from us. A perfect worship, with no compromises and no substitutes. God the Father credits Jesus with our idolatry. Every sin we've ever committed, every rejection of God's glory, every compromise of his command, and every refusal to honor God's decisions. Jesus takes the punishment we deserve for it, and in rising from the dead, he wins for us his reward. Total unity with God the Father and unrestrained joy in serving him. And when this happens, God gives us the ability to suffer like Jesus did, killing every idol inside, including the idol of approval, for the glory of Yahweh of hosts. Frank Herbert argued that charismatic leaders may be dangerous to your health, but your hunger for the approval of others is a danger to your soul. The power and popularity we crave is a magnet to our corruptibility. And unless we turn to God as our object of worship, unless we turn to him as our ultimate savior, we will be forever trapped in the lie that we can replace him. Do you want freedom from that? Do you recognize that you yourself are not worth worshiping? And if you do, will you turn and serve the God who is? Let's pray together. God, I know that I'm not worth worshiping. I know that I need you as my savior from my my idolatry. And so I ask that you would come and, and move my heart to follow you and love you more. I ask that for each, each and every person in this room as well, Lord, in your name.